You're listening to Church Unlimited Sermon of the Week online. For more information, please visit our website or our church app. We trust you'll be blessed by this message from Sean Adams. For the last couple of days, I've been reminded about something that happened when I was a teenager. Myself and my brother were driving in the car, and I don't know what possessed us, but we decided to drive with coffee, not a travel mug, but a normal coffee mug. Now, that's a bad idea, straight up. Climbing in the car with a normal mug full of coffee. And we were going to a friend's house, and uh, something happened. Uh, A guy in front of us might have stopped. We might have driven too fast, whatever. But I spilt my coffee on my lap. And uh, we joked about it, and we got to the friend's house. And lo and behold, this car drives up. And this guy, we were young adults, teenagers, this grown adult tried to pick a fight with us. He sticks his head out the window. He's like, what did you guys say to me back there? I mean, we didn't roll our window down. Maybe he saw through the window that uh, we had maybe said something. I just spilled hot coffee on my lap. And all we did was try and avert anything serious. And I don't know why, but lately I... This memory has been coming back to me, and I play it over and over. I mean, it's not haunting me or anything, but I've played it over and over, and I thought, there are so many other things I could have said. I could have had a better comeback. And this morning, I'd like to speak about the comeback, how we are designed to come back, recoil, bounce back, and rise up out of the ashes. And I pray you'd be blessed by this message. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I want to thank you so much, Father, that you, you've designed us to bounce back. You've designed us to come back. And I pray, dear Jesus, that we'd be able to position ourselves just right so that you can do what you need to do to help us come back from things that might look like they want to break us. We pray this in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My kids are just starting to swim right now, and they're actually getting quite good. But one of the fun things we do in a swimming pool is you take a ball and you push it down as deep as you possibly can. And this inflated object, the deeper you push it down, the more you're building up back pressure to have it jump out the water. Now imagine if you were that ball. Imagine that a dad and his tribe grabbed you and tried to push you under the water. And the more you struggled to get up, the more they pushed and pushed and pushed. You might think, this is over, it's done. I'm never gonna see daylight again. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they let you go and something takes over. This the something inside you, the air inside of you, compels you to rise up and jump, not just to resting level above the surface of the water, but shoot into the air. All the kids around you clap and cheer because your comeback was amazing. And I want to encourage you with the sermon today that you would know God wants you to come back from whatever's trying to push you down under the water. And as that ball deep down, as you touch the bottom of the pool, you might sometimes feel it's done. You're finished, but God has designed you and his desire for you is that you would come back. And we see all over scripture stories, incredible stories of God's people as a nation, of God's people as individuals coming back from adversity, coming back from that which tried to kill them. I remember when I was a teenager, there was a Christian musician by the name of Carmen. He was horrible. (laughs) He was a white cowboy rapper. And uh, when I was a teenager, I thought he was cool. But in particular, I really loved his music videos. I found one on YouTube the other day, and it was horror. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was interesting, to say the least. Wow, we have come a far way. Uh, but uh, he had the song that he did about uh, Jesus dying on the cross and uh, that all the demons and all of hell was cheering because they had managed to kill Jesus. 
And then Jesus comes back. Pandemonium breaks out in the music video with uh, really badly dressed and uh, painted demon-like figures that are just panicking and running all over the show because Jesus is alive and they thought he was dead. What a comeback. Probably the ultimate comeback of all times was when Jesus came back from the grave. But there's so many stories all over the Bible of this comeback. Like, for example, the story of Esther. Now, Esther is a story of the nation of Israel, really. She is the protagonist, and you can read about the story in the book of Esther. It's not that long, but it's the story of Israel's comeback. You see, in the backdrop of the story, the nation of Israel finds themselves in a foreign land. They were exiled there many, many years before, and uh, are under a foreign, godless ruler. And uh, in this ruler's court, there is a man by the name of Haman that absolutely dislikes God's people. And he devises a plot to get rid of them. So he manages to sneak in this decree from the king that on a certain day, Israelites are fair game. God's people are fair game. If they owe you anything, if you've got any discrepancy against them, you can, you can measure out that discrepancy with a pound of flesh. You can take what you want. You can do what you want to them. And so that is the, the challenge that the nation of Israel is facing. Now, God is not surprised by anything. God knew that this was coming, and God had already set a plan in motion. He was busy pulling the spring back helping it to get taught, helping it to get ready, that at the right time the spring would recoil and uh, the nation would come back. So in the interim, what happened was Esther. Esther was actually an orphan. Both of her parents had died, and she was taken in by Mordecai, who was her cousin, but also her uncle. So a little bit of a, a bold and the beautiful type story. And Esther makes it into the king's palace. She doesn't just make it into the king's palace. But she uh, gets uh, appointed as the queen, his number one lady. And in that space, her, her Mordecai, her Mordecai, let's just call him her Mordecai because cousin uncle is just too complicated. Uh, in the backdrop, at one stage, he hears about a plot to overthrow the king while he's standing at the gate. And he tells someone who tells the king who thwarts the plan and Mordecai is once again forgotten about. Then, years later, uh, the, the plan of Haman starts coming to fruition. And as the comedy of errors would have it, he actually knows Mordecai. And he really doesn't like Mordecai. So other than him planning to destroy the nation of Israel, he really wants to destroy Mordecai. Who's God's man right now, unfortunately for Haman? And so he starts to plot to humiliate Mordecai. And he also is a very prideful man, this Haman guy. And he wants even more recognition. And so in the end, without divulging too much of the story, because the sermon's not really about Esther, in the end, um, Esther uh, presents herself to the king, presents the case of the Israelites in a very clever way, and the Israelites are able to turn this whole thing on its head, and they actually exact revenge on those that come to them, and they ended up walking away from the situation with even more than when they started. What an incredible comeback. God knew what was coming. He put things in place and things in motion for God's people to come back from adversity. They must have been absolutely terrified. But the verse that I'd like us to look at in this book of Esther is Esther 4.14. And this is the word that Mordecai says to the girl that uh, he's been asked to look after. This is what Mordecai says to Esther. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I really feel that this is the anchor verse for the sermon. Who knows? 
but that you won't come to this kingdom, to this country, wherever you might find yourself while you're listening to the sermon. If you're in this town, this church, this challenge for such a time as this, that you have been prepared by God for the recoil, for the comeback, for the bounce back, for you to rise up out of the ashes, for your community to rise up out of the ashes, for your country to rise up out of the ashes. God has a plan to see His people, His people, victorious. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. The scriptures are, are, are endless. Uh, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but God comes to bring life and that we may have it in abundance. So, how do we prepare ourselves and our hearts for this recoil, for this comeback? Well, we anchor it in a twofold theology. The one is God is sovereign. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. He is in command and control. The other is God has a plan. And those two, when they work in tandem, give us a confidence that we can anchor our mission in, that we can anchor our purpose in, that we can anchor our comeback in, that is unshakable. You know, it's one thing to know that someone's in charge. Uh, it's another thing to know that the person in charge has a plan for you, that he knows your name, that he knows your position, he has a strategy, he's in control, and he knows where he wants this to go. Those two realities in tandem are the unshakable foundation that we move through life in. That when struggles come our way, we know that God's in control and He has a plan for me. And it's not my responsibility to shrink back or, 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 or die or, 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 or give up or run away. It is my responsibility to know, God, you're in control. And God, you have a plan. So, what is your plan for me? What are you calling me to do in this time? What are you calling me to do and respond in this time? And I want to tell you there's many ways that we respond in times of adversity that uh, are not godly. They're real. We get upset. We get angry. We get resentful. We get hateful. We get vengeful. All of these things God commands us not to. And so how should we respond in times of adversity? Because I need you to know, no matter how dark, no matter how sad, no matter how broken, no matter how far you feel you have fallen from God's grace, God's attitude towards you is always one of love, one of hope, one of, you're my child, I'm your father, and I want to lead you through this. So let's look at a couple of scriptures that anchor our knowledge in the fact that God is sovereign. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29 reads like this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Which in other words, he's saying, are not those two sparrows almost worthless in your eyes? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. In verse 30 it says, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. For some of us, it's easier to count the hairs in our head. So Jesus clearly loves me more because I make the job easier for him. You know, I'm just joking there, hey? But uh, what the scripture's saying is sparrows that are sold for, uh, for next to nothing are almost worthless in your eyes. And even God decides when one lives and one dies. Nothing is out of his control. And it says, yeah, if that is what he thinks and cares for the sparrows, how much more would he care for you if he even knows how many hairs are on your head? Colossians, Colossians, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 reads like this. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And there are so many scriptures that speak about God's sovereignty, God's control. But if you zoom out for a second and look at the entire canon of scripture, and you see 
as you, 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 you watch the movement of God's people, as you see how God deals with his people, both in the Old and New Testament, you see the power of God leading people up out of adversity almost every time. And so often you might think as a human, you would have done it better. Why didn't God just save them from that? Uh, why, why don't we have God that's a, a lawnmower parent? You know, you get helicopter parents that hover all the time. Then you get lawnmower parents that just get rid of every obstacle in the road so their kids can just have a clean, open road with no struggles or no problems ever, which isn't necessarily the best thing. Something as parents, we struggle, but our kids need to figure some things out for themselves at least and more and more as they progress. But like, for example, King David writes in Psalm 23, uh, uh, Psalm 23, he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why can he say that? Because he walked through the valley of the shadow of death. God allowed him to walk through that valley. And after coming out the other end, he knew he didn't have to fear evil. That's why he can say that God prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God didn't remove him from his enemies, but he nourished him in the midst of the fight and gave him hope. Jesus says to Simon Peter, he says, so just before he betrays him uh, with the crowing of the rooster, he says to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. I have prayed that your faith would not fail. And then he says to him, he says, Simon, after you have returned, strengthen your brothers. He's basically saying to him, Simon, Satan is coming to test you. And you know what, my boy? You're going to fail this one. You're going to fail it in the practical, but your faith is not going to leave you. Your faith is not going to fail you, and you're going to come back, and you're going to come back stronger, my boy. So when you come back, strengthen your brothers. And so we see as we follow the story of Scripture again and again, if you just take little glimpses, you think maybe God isn't sovereign. But when you zoom out and you see the end, you see again and again and again, God is sovereign. Nothing happens while he's sleeping because he never sleeps and he never slumbers. And he has a plan, which is so encouraging for me to know, no matter what's going on, that God has a plan. You know, as I play with my kids, sometimes uh, I put them in uncomfortable situations. Uh, maybe uh, I want to balance them on my hands or something. Like my daughter was uh, sitting on, riding on my back two days ago, and she trusted me so, I didn't even realize she had done this. But you know when maybe you remember riding on your dad's back, you expect her legs to be wrapped around you. Now, I didn't even realize her legs weren't wrapped around me. She was sitting on my lap with her legs, she was sitting on my back with her legs crossed, reading a book. And I was uh, busy on my haunches playing with my baby Daniel, and I wanted to move, not realizing that her legs were crossed on my back. As I moved, she fell off, and she fell with her bum on the floor, and she, she got quite hurt. Uh, but she's learned to trust me, because in times that I had put her in uncomfortable situations where she didn't want to let go, didn't want to leave, didn't want to balance, I'd always say, I've got this, my babe. Just listen to me. I've got you. I'm not going to drop you. I'm not going to let you go. I remember many years ago, I shared a story about my kids, and I, uh, in, in my sermon, I said, uh, my kids, no, I'll never drop them on purpose. And one of the mothers came to me after the sermon. She said, I heard what you said there. I'll never drop my kids on purpose. Well, I dropped her by mistake because she had learned to trust me. Now I need to build up that trust again. God doesn't have to do that with us because God doesn't drop us and God doesn't make mistakes and God doesn't have his eyes on one of his kids and not on the other. His eyes are always on you and he has a plan. Jeremiah 29, 11. We all know this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a hope and a future. And we also know that while God was declaring this prophecy over his people, they were in exile in a country they didn't want to be, in a land they didn't want to be, and they were still there for many years after this prophecy. And even there in the hardships, God was declaring, I have a plan. Don't lose faith. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 this reads like this. 
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. What's another word for purpose? But plan. All things work together for good for those who are called according to His plan. And so things will work out according to God's plan in His timing and with His ending in mind. I'll read one more scripture here about this point. Psalm 33 verse 11 reads like this. The counsel of the Lord, the advice of God, stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. His plans were not just for one generation, for one season. His plans are eternal. He always has the same heart towards us, plans for victory and plans uh, to come back. So it's with those two ideas in mind that we tackle the challenges that come our way. Now I've got a list of things I'd like to run through practically that we can bear in mind when we find ourselves in the depth of a challenge, pushed under the water by a group of kids that want to just think it's funny for us to go under the water. Um, uh, pushed down, beaten up, thrown into the fire. How do we, other than knowing that God has a plan for us, position ourselves and our minds to come back from adversity? Okay, first thing is this. Check your vitals. Do you feel a pulse? I have a pulse. That means I'm alive. That's not subjective. That doesn't depend on my opinion. If I have a pulse, that means I'm still alive. I'm still here on earth. And if I'm alive, God's not finished with me. And if you're alive, God's not finished with you. Don't listen to the father of lies. Our God is not the father of lies. And the devil will tell you, you failed, you're worthless. You cannot do this anymore. No one needs you. No one loves you. No one's ever going to love you again. You're never going to get through this. Don't listen to the liar, the deceiver. Your God has ordained that you are still alive. And if you're here, he has a plan for you. And you know he has a plan for you by this. Is he your king? Yes. Are you alive? Yes. I rest my case. Check your vitals. If you're alive, let's be alive. Let's not give up. Let's not listen to the father of lies. Number two, act in the opposite spirit. The Bible is full of opposites, full of opposites. And it's incredible how God works this out. Uh, a friend of ours who's preached in the church before, Brad Lane, posted this comment on social media the other day in the midst of the social unrest in uh, Gauteng and Natal. What a profound comment. He writes this. Generosity is the antidote to corruption, greed, and looting. Act in the opposite spirit. Generosity is the antidote, the spiritual antidote. Now, there are many instances where in the physical fight of life, we act Physically, uh, if, if, if someone comes to hurt you, you block, you defend yourself. That's why we have police. That's why we have people to protect us, security companies. We, that's why we have houses with alarms and, and burglar bars and things to protect us. We actively protect ourselves. There is actively something practical you do. But there is also a spiritual way to tackling these things because our war is not just against flesh and blood. In actual fact, our war is only against powers and principalities. And what happens in the flesh is a result of what has happened in the spiritual. And how do we tackle in the spiritual? We tackle it with the opposite spirit. If there is a spirit that just wants, then in God we give. Now this might sound pie in the sky, but it's littered all through Scripture. The Bible says when we are weak, that's when we're actually strong. The Bible says it's only when we lose our lives that we actually gain our lives. If you look at Matthew chapter 5, uh, where it says, love your enemies, pray for those that persecute you, that scripture, it goes, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn also the other one. If anyone wants your tunic, give him your cloak. If anyone demands you to walk a mile, walk two miles. Give to one who begs and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. And then he goes on to say, have you heard that it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What an opposite spirit. 
in a book I read a little while ago, The Son of Hamas. It's a biography of the prince, uh, the son of one of the founding members of the militant Islamic group Hamas. And he writes that the scripture that converted him, that grabbed his attention towards Christianity, because he ended up becoming a born-again Christian, uh, leaving Hamas. It's an incredible story. He becomes a spy and eventually writes his book and flees for his life. But he writes, this is the scripture that grabbed his attention because he was raised in a militant household in, in a country that was always at odds and at war with other people because of what they did and what they didn't do. And there was always this vicious retaliation, this endless cycle. And when this scripture came to him, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's like, what? What kind of God would say this? It gripped his heart. It's an opposite spirit. Many years ago, probably 20, 2007, 2008, before Melissa and I came into ministry, uh, I was working in the corporate sector and we had bought a couple flats and uh, the rent was kind of covering the bonds. We were early on in life and it was, a, it was a wonderful, wonderful thing that we did there. We see the wisdom of God in it. But in that season, interest rates shot through the roof. Many of you will remember this. And we, our rent no longer covered the bonds. We got credit cards and we maxed out those credit cards. And I want to tell you, we were in trouble. We were in serious trouble. We were on the verge of losing everything. We came to a finance course here at church and I honestly can't even remember what the course was really about. Obviously, many of those things have just become second nature to me. But something spiritual happened at that course. Something significant wherein I term it, the spirit of mammon was broken over us. And in that course, although we got a whole bunch of fantastic biblical principles for our finances, uh, we went and drew everything that we had left in our bank accounts. It was less than 100 rand. And we gave it to someone at the course. And we cut up our credit cards. And uh, that was it. Uh, we were done trying to fix this ourselves. And the systems we were using were broken anyway. And I can't remember the exact timeline. But a couple months later, our credit cards were paid for. Even one of our cars was paid for. And we were sailing. Our feet were on the ground again. And that was broken, I believe, when that spirit of mammon was broken. We instead of just hoarding we gave. We didn't give ourselves into, into, into poverty. We gave what we had. Gave a hundred rand and that was what God, God had led us to do. It wasn't something we did trying to manipulate him. We felt God say, this is what you need to do. And you'll see in scripture there's various levels of faith. Uh, there was the lady that felt she needed to uh, touch the cloak of Jesus, the garment of Jesus to be healed. She felt, because what God told her, that she needed to do something to activate that faith. There are other portions in scripture where someone else just prayed for someone. Their friends lowered them through a roof. They had to do nothing and they were healed as well. There are varying aspects of faith in our lives and sometimes God's going to call you to do something. Sometimes he's going to call you to sit back and watch as he does something. But in the space, God had called us to do something in the opposite spirit to break that spirit over our lives. Maybe sometimes someone is being nasty to you. Well, the opposite spirit is to love them back. Maybe someone is trying to just lord their authority over you. Well, the opposite spirit is to submit to that. Uh, I've heard so many stories about marriages that are really struggling, uh, where husbands are struggling with things with their wives. And so often in a marriage, you, you want to fight for what's yours and demand for what's yours. And more often than not, I've heard testimonies of where husbands, I speak more to husbands than wives, so story comes from their perspective, where they uh, just took a step back and instead of fighting for what they wanted, started to pray for their wife, pray for God's love, pray for God's peace, just pray and how something shifted and how their wives turned their hearts back to them. Act in the opposite spirit. Point number three, take responsibility. Now, this is a layered point, and the first layer is this. You need to take responsibility sincerely for what God's called you to do. Scripture says that we all uh, form part of a body, and we all have a part to play. And you need to let this sink into your heart right now. For me, right now, I am the only person that can be my wife's husband. 
And that comes with a whole bunch of responsibilities that only I can fulfill. And if I resign from that position, what happens is my wife suffers for that. I am the only person that can father my children. And if I resign from that, my wife cannot father my children while I'm here. If I wasn't here, God would make another plan. God is a father to the fatherless. God is there to support ladies that don't have a husband in their lives. But then God is still in control and God still has a plan. Right now, I am God's plan to fulfill that role in my family. And if I am not fulfilling that role, and if I've resigned myself from being the husband that God called me to be, from being the father that God called me to be, my wife and my kids will suffer for that. So take responsibility. God, who am I? What is it you've called me to do? Pretty simple, those basics. If you're a husband, husband. If you're a father, father. If you're employed in a position that God has called you to, that you're doing faithfully, that's what he's called you to do. I am called to be shown in this church. No one else can be shown in this church. What has God called you to do? And the second layer to this responsibility is this. Stop playing the blame game. As long as you can blame your situation on anyone else, you resign from doing anything about it. I'm here because of them. I'm here because they let me down. I failed because of them and that and this. As soon as you stop blaming your situation on everyone else, you can take ownership and say, I'm here. I'm done blaming. God, how do I bounce back? God, how do we gain control? How do we get out of the situation? Instead of blaming, you can't change the role that those people play. You struggle enough to control your reactions to struggle. How on earth are you going to control their reactions? Don't leave your comeback in other people's hands. Your comeback is in God's hands and in your hands. Let's see how we can sprout up out of these ashes and bring life into God's kingdom once again. Point number four. Enlarge the frame by which you view the world. Enlarge your frame. The frame is that window through which we view the world. When we go through hard times, that frame gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until all we can see is what we don't have. All we can see is our struggling and our suffering and where we find ourselves. We become blind to what we actually have. We become blind to how fortunate we actually are. So make your frame bigger, first of all, and have a look at what you have. Yes, there are things that you might not have right now, but what do you still have in your life? Who do you have in your life? What do you have in your life? Those things are important that we can fix our eyes on those things and think about those things. Even as the scripture shares with us uh, how we can find peace in our lives in Philippians chapter 4, it says that uh, we should submit everything to God with prayer, supplications, and thanks. And when we submit everything to God in prayer, the peace of God that passes all understanding will, will guide our hearts. And then it says, now, once you've received God's peace, think about these things. Whatever is good, whatever is noble, whatever is pure. The Bible basically says that we have control over our minds and what we think about. And so you need to make sure that you're not just focusing on your problem. You should be focusing on what you have and on God. Change your frame, make it bigger. And the other thing that happens when we make our frame bigger is we see what else is going on in the world. And very often in the big picture, no matter what we've lost, we still have so much more than so many other people out there. And we are so favored and so blessed. So make your frame bigger. In closing, God has designed you to bounce back. He's not a lawnmower parent, and he's not going to remove obstacles from your life. But he does want you to come back from everything that this world can throw at you. No matter how dark, lonely, or desperate you might feel, God is in control. He still has a plan. So take charge. Give God what is God's. Do what God's calling you to do, and I sincerely pray for your comeback. If you need ministry of any kind, there's a number that's appeared on the screen now. Please contact that WhatsApp. Send us a WhatsApp. Phone us. There's people waiting to pray for you. If you're visiting us, 
please join us in the Visitor's Lounge. There is a Zoom link on screen and in the comments. We'd love to chat with you there. And if you're listening to this message at a later stage and that Visitor's Lounge is closed, please phone the number in the description. and We'd love to connect with you should you need anyone to speak to. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your ministry. Thank you, Father God, that you are with us all the time, that you never sleep, that you never lose control or touch. We love you, Lord. We worship you. And we pray that you would have your way in our lives and that we would not shrink back from the struggles that come our way. We pray this in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless you.